see all of you today. We are going to, oh, praise God, we're going to start worship today, so if you would join us in standing to our feet, let's uh, give God the praise and honor that he deserves. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you are good and that your love endures forever. Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Uh, They're new every second. So God, we know that as we are in Christ, we're forgiven forever and uh, we can receive uh, peace and joy and uh, all of those fruits of the, the Spirit, Lord. And so we're here today, we're thankful and we're excited about what you're going to do in our lives and in the life. Uh, just the lifespan of this church, Lord. We are, um, God, just coming to you desperate for more of you. So, Lord, would you open our hearts even now and begin to prepare us for an encounter with you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open up 
the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our place. Flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Come on, church, let's give God praise this morning for his goodness. Amen. While I fix something on the guitar, would you turn to your neighbor, look around, and just kind of wave at somebody, tell them good morning, say hi. Alrighty, well, we are going to be introducing a new song to you guys this morning. Um, I pray that it is really just a melody of victory as we are all dealing with such stressful and difficult times. So this is how the chorus goes. When I fight, um, I will fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Uh, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen? Amen. We have victory in Christ, so let's sing that together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you when all I see are the ashes you see the beauty when all I see is a cross God you see an empty tomb the victory is yours so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll see through the night oh God the battle belongs to you almighty fortress you go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. 
together and worship God this morning. Victory is his. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. What a great song. What a great song in terms of what our country needs right now. Uh, you know, the battle belongs to the Lord and the battles, with, you know, when we're fighting, we fight on our knees and that's what we need to remember that is, is really the focus. This is a spiritual warfare that all of us are engaged in, and our country needs to realize that. Uh, let me make a couple of quick announcements, and then uh, I'm going to have Annie Martin come up. We're going to share some prayer updates. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, we have a gift for you back at our information booth, so just stop by there, and Pastor Roger or someone will, will uh, talk to you about that and make arrangements for that. Uh, also, uh, David Newton is starting a new impact group this morning. Uh, we'll be in the social hall after the worship service uh, uh, based on a book, uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Really helps you understand. It's an in-depth book, but uh, using video and discussion and a study guide, it'll be a great discussion to help you understand and unravel some of the, the things that have been mysterious in trying to understand the Bible. So, Annie, come on up. Uh, she and I want to share some mission updates with you. Uh, I may have shared this first item before with you. I received an email from Galen Weiss and, and Michael Thompson. I'll let you uh, take care of that. Uh, but they reminded uh, me, in looking over this last year, um, you know, we had Nasser here from Multiply uh, in November, and he oversees ministry in North Africa and, and the Middle East. And more churches have been planted in those regions in the last five months than in the previous five years combined. And so God is doing an amazing work in that part of our world. And then secondly, they reported that, you know, we have a lot of work going on in, in different countries in Southeast Asia. And uh, in, in some of the, the three countries, Thailand and, and nearby countries around there, this last year there have been roughly 1,000 baptisms combined in those three countries. And that's been exciting. How many of you have ever met uh, one of our missionary leaders named Pon Kao. Okay, some of, some of you, there's a handful of you who have met him. I met him first in Fresno. And he lives in Thailand and oversees a lot of ministry in Southeast Asia. Uh, when COVID broke out uh, around the world, uh, Pon Kao was out of the country, out of Thailand. And so uh, he has been out of Thailand for the last nine months. He was in a nearby country. He ended up helping church leaders in that country uh, start a couple of churches. He himself led 200 people to Christ during that time. Uh, I would see him on social media, and he was continuing to train church leaders and church planters, and God continued to flourish that ministry. His plan was to come to uh, the United States in November, and he did. Uh, while he was in Fresno in December, he came down with COVID. 
And last I heard was middle of December, he was in the hospital. Uh, I don't know his current status, but we just want to pray for his health and recovery. His plan is to try to visit different churches in the early part of 2021. Uh, but Annie has some mission updates about some of our missionaries and, and also uh, some of the Harvest uh, Sunday offering money as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Pastor Aiken mentioned, it, we have some um, information in, her, in regards to Harvest Sunday. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but last uh, um, Sunday he mentioned it, that uh, we had a goal of $25,000 and 30 was given. And out of that, $5,000 was given to uh, missions. And uh, um, we as missions commissions uh, decided that in, we have several different projects that needed financial um, support. And so um, we had um, some people propose to give to an immediate need on, uh, for Bibles in North Africa. Uh, they uh, mentioned that each one of the Bibles will cost about $12. And also in Malawi, for churches need roofs at $3,500 each. Um, a motorcycles are needed at $1,200 each. Se uh, sewing machines at $150. Chickens at $4. Uh, agriculture uh, cropping kits at $300 and a scholarship for one person for a year of study to a Malawi Bible school for $2,000 per person. We as missions commissions believe that the best use that we can give uh, to your offering is to spend it on spreading the gospel in North Africa and Malawi. We propose to spend $3,500 to purchase Bibles for North Africa. And you ask, well, we have uh, uh, the Campbells, uh, who were with Cl uh, Wycliffe, and uh, why not use their app that translates pretty much in every single language that is there? So I asked the question, and I said, why not use Wycliffe app? And um, the response was, a lot of people in this part of North Africa don't have smartphones, or don't use them for reading, watching, listening. In uh, Eastern culture, symbols are very important and they're um, something very significant about interacting with God's word through a book versus an application. Even those with the smartphones will much prefer to have a physical Bible than just read it on a screen, making the real thing more precious than gold. So I, it just amazes me that uh, many of us still wanted to hold our Bibles <laughs> and highlight it. And uh, um, it's just, it, it's just amazing. So anyway, so this is what we propose to go ahead and, and purchase 3,000, um, um, use $3,500 for Bibles and $1,500 for motorcycles for Malawi. Uh, this way, their own missionaries can travel to unreached villages to share the gospel. Their individual churches uh, have committed themselves to pay for the maintenance and the services to these motorcycles. So they're not totally relying on us. And I also um, would like to share a letter that we received from Ed and Ingrid Russell. There are our missionaries in Thailand, but they're currently in Fresno. And it says, Dear Heritage Church family, thank you so much for the special blessing gift. They are referring to the $541.25 that we gave as a Christmas in October gift to each one of our missionaries. Uh, these years were not much, where not much has been normal. Your prayers and gifts have been, very spe have been especially appreciated. By mid-January, we will be, um, have been away from Thailand for a year, but our hearts have been there. We are thankful that God is starting to open the doors for us to return to Thailand. Our visa application and passport are, current, are, are currently on LA Council. Please pray with us that we will receive our visas and certificates of entry 
in time for our January 15 departure, that we will be able to be negative COVID test results and a fit to fly certificate within 72 hours before we departure. This uh, feels like a giant step of faith for us, so we are thankful that we serve a God of miracles. Wishing you God's blessings for the new year. There's so much happening around the world, and I also would like to share some updates that you may be encouraged knowing that God is still at work. Um, sometimes I wish I, <laughs> I wish I can just hand you my cell phone, and so that you might read it, and that you might listen to each one of the messages that I receive constantly. Um, sometimes asking for prayers. So there is a, a, an issue going on. Um, a lot of the people, especially in the Middle East, are being persecuted because of their faith, and so. I wish I can just give it to you so that you might be encouraged to hear what God is doing over there and, uh, and for you to pray as well. And I am so, I received the message and I was like, oh, I need to forward this message to Pastor Aiken, to Pastor Jones, to our prayer ministry. I, I just, I can't wait to pass it along so we all together can, can join them on prayers. And I'm, I'm so ready to send it then I immediately get another message saying, never mind, God already answered that prayer. So it's just like, okay, praise God. Okay, so delete. And so it, it is just, uh, it's just amazing to me what, um, what God is doing. Uh, and especially in the Muslim community, not only in the Middle East, around the world, but also in our own backyard. Uh, we... Um, uh, I have a lot of information, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of that is restricted, so I cannot uh, um, uh, pass it along every single one, but I do have one that I really would like to share with you. And um, it came not too long ago about a uh, former Muslim um, young man who goes by the name of Simon. Um, he decided to, um, he was a member of one of those very radical groups over there, and he decided to give his life to God. He accepted Christ, and uh, he decided that he also wanted to be baptized. Right after that, he, persecution started going, and he was threatened to be killed, and he was threatened that if he did not give the names of the members of the church that he was going to, or the name of the pastor that he was um, that he was being part of this church, he will be killed. And his response was that he was ready to give his life for Christ. So it is, I don't know how many of us are just so ready to say, it, okay, let it be, you know, I'm going faster. But uh, that is just uh, um, one of so many examples that uh, um, that is going on. And uh, I am so grateful that we as a congregation uh, get to be part of that, get to be part of God's greatest mission. Uh, when he could pick anybody else, he have chosen you and me. Um, so I, I feel very blessed by it. Uh, hmm. Many times when um, people who are being part of this group decide to give their lives to, to Christ, they, they leave those groups and because all the threats that they receive, not only for them personally, but also for their families and friends, and there's so many lives that have been staked because of their, uh, their beliefs that they decide to just go ahead and go back because the price is too high to pay. Um, they're not concerned for their own personal lives, but they are concerned for the lives of others. And so we decide to go back, and it usually I've been told that it lasts about one or two years when they finally decide to go ahead and leave those groups for good. Um, but sometimes um, they just go to heaven because that's the consequence. That's the price that they pay for it. Um, there's many, uh, like I said, many, many stories like that. 
Um, and I'm just thank you for your faithfulness. And I know many times you give sacrificially not only your time, but also your finances. Many of us have faced difficult times in many different ways within the last year, but remaining faithfully in trusting God. I would like to leave you with a message from Nasser, uh, he's a North Africa and Middle East regional team leader. This is a recording from him uh, that he, ha he usually has a lot of Zoom meetings and I just want to share it because I want you to be encouraged knowing that God is still at work. So let's just listen. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for praying uh, for this Vision Together conference, this second session. It was just wow. Uh, we actually went 30 minutes long. People were skipping the next uh, Zoom session um, to stay and ask questions and dialogue um, about uh, the divinity of Jesus, and we had people, um, we had students from all over, uh, but we actually had some uh, students that were still connected to Bridges who had gone back home that were joining from, from Saudi Arabia, from Morocco, um, from Iran. Uh, it was just amazing. I uh, just felt so blessed uh, to have them with us, and uh, just so, so good, and they all got to hear the gospel about 12 different ways. Um, and uh, and so yeah, so just keep praying. So for the the seeds that were planted um, today, there was a lot of, of scattering of seeds and, into the hearts of, of many lives of uh, these young people. And uh, so keep praying that God would water water those seeds, protect those seeds, and that they would grow um, because the kingdom is breaking out in, in all of their home countries, whether they know it or not. And I just feel awe oh, how God is in, inviting them inviting them into his story and, and into what he is doing, his mission, um, and all of these, these nations in the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, I'll uh, uh, give some more updates on how everything else is going um, with River of Life and all of that uh, tomorrow. We have a, our monthly um, spiritual meeting for all the leaders in North Africa on Zoom at noon Central U.S. time. And I'll usually get a few updates um, from some of the guys at that time too, so I'll, I'll pass that on. Okay, so that was just a, a Zoom conference that Nasser was in charge of, uh, basically uh, teaching and speaking to, to leaders in many different Muslim countries and many people are responding to the gospel. So, hey, at this time, uh, let's stand and children up through sixth grade can leave with Mr. Jacob to go to Heritage Kids. And I think he even has, might have some donuts. I don't know. But uh, uh, go with Jacob and let's continue worshiping through song. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. So we declare your faithfulness this morning. Faithful. You are faithful forever, you will be faithful, you are all your promises are yes and amen. You believe it. All your promises are yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Let's sing faithful this morning. You are God. Faithful, you are. Faithful, forever you will be. Faithful, you are. Oh, 
is our yes and amen. It's all your promises are yes and amen. Let's sing it again. You are faithful. You are faithful. Promises are yes and amen, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence. And I will rest in your promises. It's my confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful you are Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are And all your promises are yes Oh, yes, and amen. Well, all your promises are yes and amen. We believe that all your promises, yes and amen. Lord, you are so faithful. All your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. You're faithful in the fact that you never leave us. You give us peace. You give us joy. You give us the assurance of our salvation. You give us your word. We can grow. We can draw close to you in time of need. You are close to the brokenhearted. Thankful for you, Lord Jesus. Sing it again, Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Make his face shine upon you 
and be gracious to the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, when you're coming, when you're going, when you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you. country is broken. There are many hurting. And Father, I just pray this blessing over our country, over this congregation right now. We need you, Father. We need you right now. We come on our knees. We sing to you in the night. Only you, Father, can fix it. Only you can solve the problems of our world. And we turn to you. We trust. We trust in you alone, Father. Amen. Isn't he good? Amen. Amen. Yeah, we can do it. Amen.
Amen. Thank you very much, worship team. I appreciate that. How timely and how important. I mean, I want to piggyback on that and just give you some prayer updates from my people in church. Um, I want to encourage you to keep praying for the Gonzalez family. Um, as you know, uh, Jen's father passed away uh, Christmas Eve, and that was devastating. And the week after, her grandmother had a heart attack. And at this point, um, they're just um, providing medication to, to, co- to provide, provide comfort care for Jan's grandmother, knowing that it's, it's just a matter of time at this point. So continue to pray for the family. And then we received news this week, Mike's grandfather has come down with COVID. And uh, I shared that with some people. And I said, Man, that, they're like Job's family. Um, and so it just, it's got to be overwhelming in just things that they're going through. And so as a church family, we just want to support them and, and lift them up in prayer. And then on top of that, Friday night, I receive a, an email or a text from Pastor Roger uh, letting me know that uh, our friend Will Boschman had experienced a stroke, uh, was taken to the hospital. Fortunately, doctors were able to do surgery Friday night. Uh, and doctors went in, and they were able to remove the blood clot. They did a CT scan yesterday uh, to confirm that. I was able to stop by uh, the house Saturday morning and pray with, with Joy and just speak with her briefly. Uh, and different uh, family members were coming up. Their son was going to come up yesterday, and the daughter's going to hopefully arrive today uh, just to be with Joy and be with the family during this time. And so we just want to continue to lift these people up. Uh, and think about the, the words we just sang, you know, the, the benediction that God is with us, the song before that, our confidence is in his promises, and God is faithful. Uh, he will never leave us, but will always be with us. And so we want to cling to those promises and to pray for our nation, which is in turmoil. Let's admit it. That's what's going on. And we need to, uh, hopefully it causes us as a nation to, to turn back to the Lord and to seek him and in our situation as a nation and in our individual lives as well, okay? We are beginning a brand new series this morning, a series that's really going to last almost five months, a series called Mennonites, Radical, Ridiculous, or Irrelevant. Uh, Now, I know I've, I've shared that with some people, and they look at me, and they go, why are we doing that study? You know, why do we need that study? Well, let me illustrate the, the need for this uh, through a true story. Many years ago, there was a, a, a canning company back in Minnesota that canned vegetables, and their sales were down, and they didn't know why, and so they, they called in an extra company to come in and do a product analysis. And the com- this company came in and analyzed what they were doing and their product and their procedures, and they discovered the result was that what they were producing yeah, you know, the vegetables that they were producing were as good, if not better, than anything on the market. They didn't need to change that. They didn't need to change what, what they were putting uh, in the cans. But they, they came back and they said, what needs to change? You need to change the, the shape of your can, and you need to change the label on your can so people are aware of it. And so they did that. And uh, so in the, in the 1990s, Jolly Green Giant became the number one seller of vegetables in the country. And here's the point that relates to us. They didn't change what was in the can. The, the, the vegetable was, was as fine as it could be. All they changed was the outer appearance. All they changed was the shape of the can and the label. And I think that relates to, to Mennonites. Let me explain. See, we are... Whether you realize it or not, Heritage Bible Church, we are part of the Mennonite Brethren Conference, or MB. Sometimes we just refer to that as MB. It's easier. But I think, to be honest, if we're honest, we have an image problem. Uh, There were a couple of national surveys that were done years ago by the Mennonite Board of Mission. And uh, when they uh, asked people about Mennonites, those who... had heard of Mennonites, 82% of them had this distorted perception. When those people thought of Mennonites, they thought of people that had beards and drove buggies. Um, it, they, uh, when they thought of Mennonite, they figured, oh, that you're talking about the Amish, you know? How many of you brought a buggy this morning? 
okay? There's a few of us that have beards, but, you know, we didn't bring a buggy. Now, I can relate to that. Years ago, years ago, when I was in seminary and, and I decided to join a Mennonite Brethren Church, I told a co-worker that I had joined a Mennonite Brethren Church over the weekend. And she looked at me and said, oh, do you drive a buggy? You know, that was the, the image. That was the misconception. How many of you have ever heard of Weird Al Yankovic? Oh, several of you have. You know, I don't know if you remember, years ago he performed at the Kern County Fairgrounds. Uh, and I went to saw him and, and it was really good. He's a comedian, he's a singer, he's a songwriter. Uh, he's known for, for humorous songs about culture. I thought about playing one of his songs and then I thought better. Um, but he has, he has a song about the Amish. Some of you may have seen it. You can look it up on YouTube. It's a little irreverent. Um, but uh, a song called Amish Paradise, where he makes fun of the Amish. He makes fun of how they dress. He makes fun of, of their lack of technology. And toward the end of the song, there's a line in there that says, we're all a bunch of crazy Mennonites. And you know, even though the song is a parody, you know it's a joke, you know that there are people that watch that music video and they hear that line and they, they form an opinion you know, about Mennonites based on that, that silly song and they think you and I are ridiculous. They do. It's a misconception. But here's the good news of those people that took that survey, those two surveys years ago, when they were finally told how Mennonites really live and worship and, and dress, most of them had a positive response about Mennonites. But they, their distortion needed to be corrected. So like the jolly green giant, we don't need to change the contents of the can. In other words, we don't need to change our beliefs, but we do need to change the outer appearance and how we come across to people. And that was my experience. I was, I was born and raised in Fresno. I grew up, I did not know Mennonites existed in Fresno, and they do. Now, I grew up in a non-Christian home, and I, I later became a Christian in high school, but I, I didn't realize Fresno is home to a Mennonite Brethren College a Mennonite Brethren Seminary, and there's five or six or seven um, MB churches that are in Fresno. I did not know that was true. You know, after, I remember after graduating from high school, I, I went to Fresno State for a couple of years, and, and during those two years, I also volunteered uh, doing youth ministry, jun junior high ministry with, with Youth for Christ. And out of that experience and other experiences, I really felt a call to full-time ministry. And so I thought about that, and I thought about switching colleges, and, and a friend of mine said, well, do you know, there is, there's a small Christian college on, on the south end of Fresno. I said, is that right? And they said, yeah, it's called Pacific College, and you ought to check into it. So I went and I found it, and I discovered it is small. The entire enrollment of Pacific College at that time, now we're talking back in the 70s, this is, you know, dinosaurs still roam back then. No, but back in the 70s, the, the entire enrollment of Pacific College was as big as my high school graduating class, okay? So I went, I found in, I went into the office and I said, uh, hey, I'd like to insert some information about some of your Bible classes. And the, the secretary looked at me and they said, well, would you like to talk to our president? I go, yeah, that would be great. And so I went in, I talked with Edmund Jansen, got to know him. He was the current president. He was a great Bible teacher. And he talked about the Bible courses and I really got excited. So I enrolled, I signed up, you know. Three months later, I find out I've enrolled at a Mennonite Brethren College. And he didn't tell me that. Ed, that some, somehow Edmund left that little detail out of the conversation. And Listen, I wasn't the sharpest student that ever enrolled at Fresno Pacific, okay? I tell people, you know, I'm not the brightest crayon in the box, okay? I didn't know I was part of a Mennonite Brethren College, but, you know, but by then, it didn't matter. By then, I knew that, that Mennonite Brethren were biblical and they were sound. I enjoyed being there. Uh, now, you need to realize, even though I was attending a Mennonite Brethren College, of course, I didn't know I had signed up. 
I, I attended different churches. During college, I attended a Baptist church, and then I switched to a four-square gospel church, which was charismatic. So when I graduated from Pacific, I was not Mennonite brethren. I had been exposed. We cracked jokes about them, but I wasn't Mennonite brethren. And I was ready to go to, a, to seminary. So because of my background, I purposely selected an interdenominational seminary uh, and uh, ended up choosing one on, on the East Coast. There were about 600 students from 40 different denominations. All of the professors were, were of different denominations, so I really uh, appreciated that as well. But during my first year, I was challenged and encouraged to, to become part of a church denomination and be part of, you know, have a spiritual covering and, and a connection and not just be independent. And so I studied a lot and I prayed my first year and I came home and I made a conscious choice to become Mennonite Brethren. And that was after studying the theology and, and praying about that. Do you know that here in Bakersfield there are four MB churches and none of them have Mennonite Brethren in their name? There are people attending some of these churches, they don't even know they're Mennonite Brethren. We keep that as a secret. Otherwise, it's probably scare them away. I have friends who attend the bridge. They don't know it's Mennonite Brethren. I have friends who attend Laurel Glen Bible Church, and they don't know it's Mennonite Brethren. But that's probably a good secret. Um, but here's the thing. The name, the name, it's a cultural issue. It's not a spiritual issue. Sometimes people confuse that. Uh, see, now, in America... Um, Mennonite brethren is often associated uh, with a certain ethnicity or certain religious traditions. Now that can give people distortions and it can, it can even hurt ministry. Let me show you a quote by Lyle Schaller, who is an author and a church consultant. He makes this comment. He says, the stronger the ethnic culture, the more difficult it is to fulfill the Great Commission. And that describes churches. The reason is simple. If ethnicity is part of your church name or if, if a certain ethnicity is associated with your church name and you're not part of that ethnicity, listen, there's two things that go through your mind. First one is, I don't belong here. They're looking for a different type of people other than me. Your second conclusion is, this church is irrelevant in my life. That's why MB churches here in town don't advertise that ethnicity. You know, there are some MB churches, and thankfully, I have, I have rarely seen this at Heritage for which I thank God. In the five years I've been here, I thank God. There are some MB churches where they talk a lot about people who have Mennonite names, or churches that talk about eating Mennonite food. And I want to tell you that borders on sin. That's just my opinion of that. Now, here's the reason. Uh, in reality, that is a, a narrow-minded North American perspective. If you, if you take a global, goal, let me try to get the word out, a global perspective of Mennonite brethren, you'll find that there's about 30,000 Mennonite brethren in America. There's 40,000 in Canada. But if you go across the ocean, you'll find in Congo, there's 100,000 Mennonite brethren. But you know the country that has the most Mennonite brethren in the world? India. 200,000 Mennonite brethren. I doubt they talk about Mennonite food in India, you know, unless it's curry. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Mennonite is a historical term, okay? And so we need to understand history if you want to appreciate what it means. Now, let me give you just a, a brief historical review. This may be a, a review for some of you. It may be simplistic, um, but please bear with me because I think this is important so you understand where we come from. How many of you have ever heard the name Martin Luther? Okay. In the 1500s, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest who, after reading the Bible, he came to a new understanding of salvation. He came to a new understanding of, of having a personal relationship with God and realized that it was, it was by grace through faith. It wasn't wrapped up in a lot of church traditions, which was currently going on in the Catholic Church. And so that, that 
revelation transformed his life. It transformed his thinking. And as the Catholic priest, he said, everybody in church needs to know this. And so this needs to be shared with everyone. Let them experience this too. So his goal was to reform the Catholic church. That led to a movement called the Reformation. Anybody heard of the Reformation? Okay. That came from Martin Luther. Okay. He was so excited. So he went to the leaders of the Catholic church and they said, no thanks. Great idea. No thanks. We'd rather focus on our religious traditions. Well, Martin Luther didn't take that stand. There were other people that agreed with him. They didn't like that decision. So they, they protested against that decision. They didn't protest like people did in D.C. They were much, much more calm. Otherwise, they would have all ended up as martyrs. But they protested what, what the Catholic leaders uh, of the church had, had decided. And said so that group in their protest became known as Protestants. So Protestants originally was a group that, that was protesting the decision of, of the Catholic church. So you have, at that point, you have Catholics, now you have Protestants. There was a third group of people that agreed with, with Martin Luther. They said, you're right. But they didn't feel that Martin Luther went far enough, especially in regards to the issue of baptism. That was very important. As they studied scripture, they really came to a personal conviction and felt that, that baptism was, was a, while it was important, it was biblical, it was something that needed to be done after a person came to a point of, of believing in Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior. So they, they practiced that baptism followed, followed a person's belief. Okay? And as they studied Scripture, they felt that that was reinforced because as they studied the Gospels, they saw that, that Jesus was baptized as an adult you know, by John in the Jordan River. But then on the day of Pentecost, when God sent the Holy Spirit and filled believers and didn't, people didn't know what was going on. Peter stood up and explained, hey, this is all part of God's plan. Way back in the Old Testament, he predicted that he was going to pour out his spirit on his people, and he explained that. And it was our opportunity to recommit to God. And so the people cried out in Acts chapter 2, well, what shall we do? And here was Peter's response in Acts 2, verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They believed, and Peter said, now it's time to be baptized. If you go a little bit farther in Acts chapter 8, you have Philip who's witnessing to uh, a man from Ethiopia who worked for the government, an Ethiopian uh, eunuch. And he, Philip shares the gospel with him and, and the man chooses to believe. Uh, but then look at what happens in verse 36 of Acts 8. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? He had believed. Now he wanted to show his belief through baptism. And that's what we practice here as well. A few months ago, uh, you know, well, on, on Harvest Sunday, we, we baptized four people. Those, you know, uh, three adults and a child. They had each, they had come to a point of believing in Jesus and they wanted to show that belief by being baptized. And so we accept that as normal and common. I want you to realize in the 1500s, that was radical. So radical that sometimes you, people paid for that with their own life. For example, uh, Luther saw people, you know, adults being baptized, and he considered that to be heretical. He said that's not biblical, according to his understanding. The Catholics saw adults being baptized or believers' baptism. They saw that as criminal. Let me explain where that comes from. In the 1500s, the, the, the church and, and the government were closely tied together. In fact, whenever a baby was baptized, that family would pay taxes to the government. Okay? So every time a baby was baptized, that brought more money into the government. Um, and then when uh, these people came along and refused to baptize their babies, they said, we're not going to do that. that. That ended up being less money for the government. So the Catholic Church saw that as, as criminal. You're refusing to pay taxes by not having babies baptized. Um, 
because this group believed in, in believers' baptism, but didn't, and they rejected infant baptism, saying that an infant is not able to understand issues of faith and about Jesus and his death and resurrection. And so you had Luther and, and Catholics, they were looking at this, this third group, you know, seeing that they were heretics, they were not biblical. And so Luther and the Catholics gave a name to this third group and they called them Anabaptist. Anabaptist, not anti-Baptist. When I first heard the term at Pacific College, I heard they were teaching this Anabaptist class and I go, whoa, and I was attending a Baptist church at the time. And I go, I didn't know they were anti-Baptist. And they say, oh no, it's Anabaptist. Oh, you know, that's when the you know, things started coming together for me. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know if I joined a cult or not, but it later was okay. Uh, but the, so the, a label was given to this group that practiced believers' baptism. They were called Anabaptists, which literally means rebaptizers, and that's what was going on because everybody had been baptized in an infant as an infant in the 1500s, and now people were being baptized a second time. Those were the rebaptizers. And said, so if you were called an Anabaptist, that was a derogatory term. And it was, it was a term used for heretics, and it led to their persecution. In fact, Felix Mons was the first Anabaptist killed for his belief in 1527 in Switzerland because he believed in believer's baptism and taught it. He ended up being taken out into a river and thrown into the river, and he drowned. So he paid, for, paid with his life for, for that belief. That triggered a wave of persecution against all Anabaptists. And there was a 50-year period where Protestants and Catholics ended up killing 200,000 Anabaptists because of their belief in baptism. Now, baptism was the main issue over which the groups disagreed. Um, but there were other issues of conflict between Protestants and Anabaptists. It may surprise you. Luther was hoping to reform the medieval church. Anabaptists wanted to restore the New Testament church. Protestants wanted to establish an official state religion where they would force everybody to conform to the state religion. And Anabaptists said, no, we don't want that endorsement. They wanted to promote religious liberty, and they promoted the separation of church and state, which was radical at the time. Uh, Luther went so far as, as to suggest different lifestyles for those who were secular and those who were sacred, and Anabaptists rejected, so that's an that's a unhealthy dualism. Okay? The, the groups also disagreed over violence and serving in the military. Many Anabaptists read the Bible and they read the Sermon on the Mount and they literally obeyed what the, what the Sermon on the Mount said, what Jesus said when he taught to, to turn the other cheek and to love your enemies. Um, and so uh, their faith was seen as radical. they never seen people obey Scripture like that before. Um, well, Anabaptists, even though, even though there was a lot of persecution, hundreds of thousands of, of Anabaptists were dying for, for their belief, Anabaptism spread, and it spread into the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, there was a, a Catholic priest who learned about Anabaptism. And he, at first, when he heard that, he was shocked. He was shocked that people were willing to die for their view of baptism. And like Luther, it caused him to go back to the scriptures and, and start rereading the scriptures. What does the Bible really say? And this man, as he, this Catholic priest, as he started rereading the scripture, he became an Anabaptist. And he started teaching that. He produced pamphlets, you know, and he was supporting the Anabaptism. People began following him. They began listening to his teaching. The name of this Catholic priest in the Netherlands was Menno Simons. Well, Menno Simons had a group of people that, that objected to his teachings. And so uh, his opponents, opponents of Menno Simons, came up with a name for his followers. Guess what they nicknamed his followers? Mennonites. Mennonites originally began as a derogatory term in the 1500s to describe heretics. Mennonites was a term used to, to make fun of other people. That's the original meaning of it, okay? And so when you look at the 1500s, Anabaptists obviously were not part of the Catholic Church. They were really not colleagues with the Protestant Reformation. 
They were a third option. They are referred to often as the Radical Reformation. Now, many of, these, of their radical beliefs, believer's baptism, separation of church and state, that's taken for granted by, by many churches today. Here's the thing. In the 1500s, people were willing to die for those beliefs, those beliefs that we take for granted. Now, we know that modern-day Baptists came out of Anabaptist in England. So where do Mennonite brethren come from? Let me give you a little brief history on this. You need to understand this. It was in, in 1763, Catherine the Great, who was Tsar of Russia, which doesn't that mean like queen, the queen of Russia? She uh, offered free land and political asylum to Europeans if they wanted to move to southern Russia, which was part of Ukraine today. Okay, um, and uh, but it came with a condition: people could, you know, Europeans could could move to southern Russia, get free land, you know, freedom of religion. Uh, but it came with a condition that they couldn't share their faith, their religion, with Russian people. Okay? You can come live in our land, just keep your faith to yourself. Well, a lot of Mennonites were tired of being persecuted for 200 years. So a lot of Mennonites moved you know, to, to southern Russia. They enjoyed you know, uh, the free land, the, the freedom they were experiencing. But not being able to share their faith really led to spiritual apathy and their spiritual morals really began to erode. Uh, now, Mennonites were, were hard workers. They were farmers. And as Mennonites grew and as they prospered, two things happened while they were in Russia. One, which sometimes still happens, they isolated themselves uh, from society. The second thing that happened was that two classes of Mennonites were formed. There in southern Russia, there were the, the rich and the poor. There were the rich landowners and the poor farm workers who worked for the, the rich. Um, and so while that's going on, there was widespread spiritual apathy. And in 1860, in the midst of all of this spiritual apathy in southern Russia, God sent a revival among the Mennonites Interestingly enough, through a Lutheran pastor. He was a traveling evangelist, and he came through the area where Mennonites were living, and he did a series of revival meetings, and revival broke out, and men, a lot of Mennonites came to faith. They made a new commitment to God, uh, and in the midst of, of their new commitment, they decided, you know, we need a new church. We need a, a, a new church where Everybody is accepted as brothers and sisters, a, a church without classes. They were committed to following the, the teaching of Menno Simons. Many had been raised with that. But they wanted a church where everyone was, was on equal ground in the eyes of God. And so they came up with a name. Guess what the name was? They called it Mennonite Brethren. Okay? Mennonite Brethren began as a denomination in 1860. Okay? So we're only 160 years old. Let me conclude, wrap things up here. I, wanna, I have two goals for this series. Two goals that you need to understand. The first goal is this, that everybody needs to work at this one, okay? I'd really like you to be able to tell someone else what a Mennonite brethren is and do that in one or two sentences, okay? Because everybody in our society is confused pretty much about what a Mennonite is. For example, Somebody says, well, what is a Mennonite, you know? You, you look at them and you say, listen, Mennonite is a term from history. It began in the 1500s to describe people who were radical followers of Jesus Christ. You know, if, if that's all you say to someone, that's going to make them curious. And they go, what does that mean? And as you explain, if you're smart, if you're sharp, it gives you a chance to, to weave in the gospel. And I've done this before. And I, I've sat there and said, well, what is a Mennonite? And I said, oh, it's just a term from history. It describes a radical group of people that follow Jesus. Well, I, I, people look at me and go, what, what does that mean? And I said, have, and so you have, to, you have to know the background here. You've got to know the history. And so you really have to say, well, do you, you know who Martin Luther is? Yeah. That led to the Reformation. That created Protestants. But then another group arose that disagreed. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, 
I've done that before. Listen, if, if we don't learn to be able to tell people what a Mennonite is without taking 20 minutes and doing a review of the 1500s, you know, but at least get them curious so, so you can give them a little nutshell of history. If we don't learn to do that, society is going to keep telling people that Mennonites are, are wearing uh, beards and driving buggies. Okay, so we've got to, to work at changing that. The second goal of this series, we're going to review the main beliefs of Mennonite brethren. And we're going to do that by looking at our confession of faith. Uh, we're going to pass one out to each family. Um, as we look through our confession of faith, you'll see where most of it, where we agree with many other Christians, many other denominations. Many other denominations are also part of the, our Anabaptist movement. Um, you'll also see uh, beliefs that are, are distinctive beliefs that, that make us uh, unique. Uh, when you leave this morning, ushers are going to pass a confession of faith out to every family. And you can bring this each Sunday. And so we'll be looking at this. There's 18 articles in here. Each article will be a sermon. Uh, uh, listen, we're going to be in this uh, through the month of May. So uh, get used to that. Um, but it'll make it practical and, and real. Let me give you one example of, of how Mennonites are unique because of our theology. Mennonites were willing to be radical in their faith in the 20th century when war was breaking out around the world. And there were a number of Mennonites who believed you know, in nonviolence based on their understanding of the Sermon on the Mount. And as America was getting ready to go into war, Mennonites went to President Franklin Roosevelt and they said, our conscience doesn't allow us to kill other people, but we are, we're loyal citizens of America. We love being in America. We want to serve the country. Is there another way we can serve our country without having to go into to war? An alternate service was created at that time. Roosevelt created alternate service as a legal option for people to not serve in the military, for people who were conscientious objectors. Many of you may remember Annette's father who lived with us uh, here in Bakersfield when we moved down here. Uh, your father lived to be almost 101. Uh, his name was Leonard. Leonard had served in World War II. He had served in the army as a conscientious objector. Not all conscientious objectors avoided military. He said, Leonard signed up, signed up for the army as a conscientious objector. You say, well, what does that mean? He served as a medic in Italy. And so that's where he served in the military and as a conscientious objector. Now, he grew up on the farm, and so he could fire a rifle. He was constantly praying. He was good. <laughs> he was good at firing a rifle. And he was pressured to become a regular uh, soldier, and he said, no. His conviction said, I won't allow me to do that. And so he didn't ever pick up a gun, but he served as a medic. Leonard had a, had a younger brother who 10 years later also registered as a conscientious objector. And many conscientious objectors uh, during that time, if they stayed in America, they were sent to mental hospitals to, to go take care of mentally ill people. Now, you have to realize back in the 40s, 50s, uh, people that were sent to mental hospitals, the society didn't know how to, what to do with them. And they would just sort of send them to a hospital. Uh, they'd lock them up and throw away the key. And they, they weren't really being treated. They were just being locked up as if they were in a prison. And so all these Mennonites were, who registered as conscientious objectors were sent to, to mental hospitals. Leonard's younger brother was one of them. And Mennonite brethren, because of their faith, they, they treated people in mental hospitals as if they were human. They expressed love and care and gave them value and appreciated them. And some of those people in the mental hospitals were healed. They were able to be released. Here's the thing that what happened is that because of, of the Mennonites going into mental hospitals, that changed how mentally ill people are treated today. And it's Mennonites that did that. Why? Because that's part of our theology. That makes a radical difference. You know, because Mennonites were willing to be radical in their faith and stand up to the government, they ended up transforming the way mentally ill people are, are treated. 
So those are our two goals, to, to clarify, um, be able to clarify what a Mennonite is, be, like, be clear in our beliefs. I want to close. Uh, I know we're going along, but I want to close with two short verses from Scripture uh, where Jesus made comments. John 13, 35. Jesus told his disciples, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then a verse in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to tell you, when people see that type of faith, they'll look at that and say, that's radical. And that historically, that's who we are. We are part of the radical reformation. Wouldn't it be something if when people heard the word Mennonite, they first thought, well, that's somebody with a radical faith in Jesus. That's my goal. That's my dream that I'd love to see. But it's got to start with, with us being willing to change that and share that with others. Let's pray. Father, you... By being a follower of Jesus, you challenge us to live a radical life for you. May we learn what that means as, as Mennonite brethren, uh, understanding that and how we apply it in our lives. And so we just thank you for that. To Really, to be radical is simply to be obedient to a God that transforms our life through the kingdom of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand for a closing song. Awesome. Yeah, let's sing that uh, verse two of Battle Belongs one more time, and then we'll finish with that chorus. So, and if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll see through the night oh God the battle belongs to you oh God the battle belongs to you Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. May people, by looking at our lives, think of God and give Him glory. Listen, as you leave, ushers have a confession of faith for each family. God bless you. You're dismissed.